You turn to uh, Acts chapter 15. We've been in Acts 13, 14, and 15 over the last uh, few weeks. Uh, I so much appreciate how many gifted preachers we have in our own congregation. Uh, Eric and Kemper and Paul, they have done outstanding in the last three weeks. And uh, uh, I can't stay out of the pulpit too long. I may not have a job with those guys doing so well. But we're really blessed with that. It is good, though, for me personally to be back in the pulpit and very excited. Uh, today we're going to look at the end of Acts chapter 15. So we're going to begin in verse 36 in just a moment. You know, when I was young, uh, I always looked forward every summer to our family vacation. And uh, our normal destination was Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. With two points, I hear that amen, where we would stay, we stayed at either the Swamp Fox Inn or the Indigo Inn. It looked like maybe every other year uh, we would stay at one or the other, and we loved Myrtle Beach. Every year we would load the car with luggage and people and be ready to hit uh, south toward Myrtle Beach, but invariably we had a disruption. We would be in the car ready to go, and my dad would say, okay, everybody out, we've got to take a family picture. And I still have aversions to family pictures because of that. We would all groan, we're all ready to go, why do we have to take these pictures? And to this day, I really don't like family pictures. I avoid them if I can, but Karen and Whitney will not let me uh, avoid them. But these great family memories are sort of interrupted by this disruption and this memory that I had each year. And it did happen every year. You know, as we saw at the end of 2023, Paul and Barnabas had completed a wonderful mission trip, uh, not a vacation, but an excursion. They had seen a lot of great things happen. God had saved a lot of people through the ministry. They came back. They received, as we saw, the endorsement of the church at Jerusalem. Everything was really going well. And in just a moment, we're going to read the very first verse of our text, and we're going to see that things had gone so well, and the momentum was so positive that the two men, Paul and Barnabas, decided they were going to carry out a second trip. Yet the very next verse, the second verse of our text, we're going to read in a moment, tells us that there was not a minor delay like picture taken, but there was a major disruption as these two men had a strong difference of opinion as to how they were to go about uh, the trip. Next week, we're going to begin in Acts chapter 16, and we're going to look at Paul's second missionary journey. We finished the first journey in early December and uh, in November and December. Uh, we're going to begin next week, but before uh, we do that, today I want to look at these last six verses of Acts chapter 15 as we prepare uh, next week for that look. Look with me at Acts 15. In verse 36, after some time had passed, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brothers and sisters in every town where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take along John, who was also called Mark. But Paul insisted they should not take along this man who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone on with them to the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed off to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed. After being commended by the brothers and sisters to the grace of the Lord, he traveled through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Let's pray together. Father, as we look to your word today, um, we thank you that in the Bible... You don't edit out the uncomely parts. That, Father, your word is truth, and we can learn even through divisions and differences that come about from the fallenness of humanity. And so, Father, speak in, in this hour. Uh, may your name be lifted up, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
You know, we really don't like to see flaws in our heroes, do we? Uh, I remember when I was about five or six years old, I was convinced that my father was the strongest man in the world. There was no one stronger. Um, and now uh, my great aunt at that time had little filter, uh, was not thinking in the way I did. And so she informed me my dad was not the strongest man in the world. And I can remember how that hit me like a ton of bricks. It was devastating. You know, as we look at this case with the Apostle Paul, if you're like I am, you sort of lift up Paul and you lift up Barnabas. They're great examples. One of the beautiful things about Scripture is that it does not ever it in the narratives, the uncomely parts, just as I prayed. In other words, it doesn't try to misrepresent people, but it presents people as we see things would happen. And so here we see that these two giants who had accomplished so much in the Lord began to develop a strong disagreement over this man, this young man, John Mark. And I can remember, I, I believe it was about when I was in seminary looking at this for the first time, and, and I knew Paul called himself the utmost of sinners, but to see a man who seemed to be so intolerant of a young man, it sort of struck me. But then I needed to be careful because we don't know all of the facts of this. We don't know what happened. And today we're going to see uh, a good reason that Paul had for not including John Mark. Nonetheless, we need to understand that whether it be the preacher behind this pulpit, which uh, my wife would be the first to tell you I'm not perfect, or whether it be a television preacher, or whether it be Martin Luther, the father of the Protestant movement, or whether it be Abraham and the Bible, or Jacob, or whomever, uh, no human being is without flaws, that we're sinners. And it's a wonderful thing that God can use sinners to accomplish a great work. So this morning, I want to look at this disagreement that Paul and Barnabas had. The scriptures does not bypass it. And so we won't bypass it either. And, and we see here in verse 39 that there was a disturbance. And it said that this disturbance was actually a sharp disagreement in verse 9, verse 39 rather, between Paul and Barnabas. The Greek uh, noun that translates uh, these two words is the word from which we get our English paroxysm. And it speaks to a sudden, abrupt, and violent expression of emotion. Physically, we might compare it to a spasm. Have you ever had a cramp or a spasm and it just locks up on you and immediately your whole body is sent into conflict? In other words, as we look at this sharp disagreement, it wasn't a minor disturbance, but it was closer to really a verbal throwdown between these two men of God. And these two men were friends. Paul and Barnabas were great friends. In fact, we read in Acts chapter 11 that Paul was introduced into the church at Antioch because of Barnabas. Barnabas was an encourager. Barnabas was the one who when everyone heard that Paul had become a, a Christian and they doubted it, he said, he has my endorsement. He brought Paul into the church and the church accepted this man who formerly had persecuted uh, believers. And so these two friends, now we see at the end of Acts chapter 15, not only were they friends, but they were fellow travelers on a missionary journey. And now they were divided over the direction that the ministry moving forward should take. Now, I'll be the first to say, we don't know all the variables of this disagreement. We don't know what precipitated it. We don't know um, the attitudes, really, that behind, were behind it. We didn't hear the voice inflections that are described in this. We just know that it was a, a major disagreement. And there's some things, I believe, that we can learn today, some truths from God's Word, as we consider this really unseemly, transaction or narrative in the New Testament. And the first thing we can see is this, no one is bigger than the mission. In fact, we would argue that is probably in all likelihood the Apostle Paul's argument here. The disagreement revolved around John Mark. John Mark was a young man at that time. Barnabas and Paul were older than he was. 
And, and it had to do, as they were moving toward this second trip, would John Mark be a part of the trip or not? Now, if you remember in our study in October, uh, in November, in the first part of December, that John Mark began the first trip that Paul and Barnabas were a part of. And that when they uh, uh, reached a place called Pamphylia, John Mark abandoned the mission group. He went back home to his mother in Jerusalem. And now we see months later, Paul and Barnabas are planning a second trip. And Barnabas, who's excited, they both in verse 36 are excited about it. Barnabas offers the idea, let's take John Mark with us on the trip. And he was excited. It may have been that Barnabas was guilty of nepotism because, see, uh, John Mark was his cousin. Uh, we don't know what that is, but, but I'm sure that the attitude of Barnabas, who was an encourager, uh, who often would look at the cup being half full, he was probably saying to Paul, or his attitude was this, we ought to give him a second chance, he's learned from it, and let's move forward. But we see in verse 37 that Paul's attitude was the exact opposite. In other words, he rejected the notion of including John Mark. And, and I'm sort of paraphrasing it here, but you might, it might help us understand Paul's attitude in this. And it would be this as he was speaking to Barnabas. Hey, don't you remember he abandoned us on the first trip? We don't have enough resources to be feeding somebody on this trip if at the first sign of difficulty, he's going to abandon us. And so we see that Barnabas may have been guilty of nepotism or looking at it uh, with rose-colored glasses. It may have been that Paul was being too strict and too harsh. Whatever the case was, there was a disagreement. And as we look at it, and as we see what is going to transpire in the next few weeks, while we realize that this is not an attractive event to happen between two Christians, we can agree with this. No person is bigger than the mission. You've heard the saying, there's no I in a team. Some of y'all have been coaches and you understand where I'm going about the chemistry of a team. And sometimes if you feel like that one is, is sort of receiving preferential treatment or is going off on his own, then you would say the team is bigger than any individual person. And so I believe that Paul was looking at Barnabas and he was understanding that Barnabas really wanted to give a second chance to this nephew or this uh, cousin. And so Paul is saying, wait a minute, Barnabas. Us, we're involved in serious stuff here. And this isn't only about one person. This is about a group. And, and, and we need to make sure that nothing is going to affect the mission going forward. Now, how do we apply that today? No one person or one family should take precedence over the mission of the local church. That, that the church should be involved in, in the ministry that God has called it to, God's will for the church. Paul was uncompromising. The mission must not be affected. That was his attitude. And this year, God is giving us a mission. Do you realize that God has a mission for you individually? that God has a mission for me individually. I don't know all of that right now. I'm seeking that. I trust that you're seeking that. That mission may be a ministry in the church. It may be a ministry in the community. It most certainly will be proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. And that mission is to be our priority and we're to keep our hand to the plow. So in Paul's defense, we might say that he was focused on the mission and rightly so. Now, how he handled that, we might debate. But let's look at a second truth that's very important, and it's this. God can bring good out of a not good situation. He can bring good out of a not good situation. And don't get me wrong, 
This was not a good situation. I mean, here were two warriors for the Lord. They had fought shoulder to shoulder. They were receiving persecuting and threats as they were traveling on these trips and they were having to join together. Uh, they came back and people were questioning the work that they were doing. They traveled to the holy city of Jerusalem to get affirmation. I mean, they were tied together in the ministry. And these men who stood together against those who opposed them now were at odds themselves. You know, if the devil can't hit you in one area, he'll try to hit you in another area. And we can see here where the devil was trying to get in the midst of these two men to try to divide them and stop the ministry. We already see that the church in Jerusalem through the Jerusalem Council endorsed the ministry, which uh, further provided the impetus for them to move forward. And so I believe the devil was trying to change his strategy. Still in the midst of the variables in the midst of the disconcerting ways of these two men there was one constant God God was still working the gospel train as we saw was still moving it would not be stopped you know as much as it could be attainable it's not and that is perfect unity we would love to have perfect unity but we're fallen human beings. We're imperfect. As I said, just ask Karen if you wonder about me. And there are one hundreds of me in this congregation. And, and from time to time, there will be conflict. Uh, I used to love the bumper cars. And we shouldn't be surprised if you have a little room smaller than this and about 10 or 12 cars, invariably, they're going to bump into one another. And when we're doing ministry, there are times when ministry really goes smoothly and everyone's opinion is in concert. But then there are times, as we see here, that there's a difference in opinion. And that was the case. But I want you to see today that in spite of the imperfections and the conflict, God was still working. The gospel was advancing. You know, God wants the gospel to advance today. He wants people to hear that Jesus loves them, that Jesus died for them. He wants people to hear that Jesus is Lord of all. In fact, the gospel has not stopped. It continues to work. And it, it works in spite of the fallibility of men. Think about how the gospel got to Antioch. Antioch was the sending church for both the first and second journeys. How did it get there? Well, you remember in Jerusalem, there was a persecution of believers. People who didn't believe in the Lord thought, we will shut these people up by threatening them. We will threaten them. We will threaten their families. We will threaten their lives, and it will shut them up. You know what it ended up doing? It made the gospel mobile. People began to move out into areas, and they were sharing the gospel. The gospel got to Antioch, and as we'll see into southern Galatia, the gospel was moving. And so we see that in spite of the opposition of unbelieving people, the gospel was still moving forward. And today we see in spite of the division of two believing people, the same thing is true, that actually it resulted in good. And we would never think that. We would say, man, everything has gone together well. It was a great first trip. They had a great trip together. The, the, the church, the, the main leaders in the church of Jerusalem were behind them. But now this division has happened. Oh, no, what's going to happen? But remember this, God is sovereign. One of the verses that was in the Bible was drawn to my attention a number of years ago by my, my mentor and good friend, Ben Lehman, actually by his wife, Cindy, is Isaiah 46, 11. I remember her sharing it when they did a mission trip here a number of years ago. And God is speaking in this verse. And God says, I call a bird of prey from the east, a man for my purpose from a far country. Yes, I've spoken, so I will bring it about. And what we see here in the book of Isaiah, that God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah, and he's saying, I'm calling a bird of prey, which figuratively really speaks to um, the fact that there would be an ungodly king, King Cyrus, who over a hundred years after that 
would come on the face of the earth and would allow the people of God to be freed and go back into the land. And so as we look at it here, uh, we see that God was working through an ungodly king to bring out a godly purpose. And here in Acts chapter 15, we see that God is working through an unseemly situation, the conflict of two believers to do the very same thing. Notice what it says in verse 39. They had such a sharp disagreement, they parted company. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed to Cyprus. But then in verse 40, Paul chose Silas and departed after being commended by the brothers and sisters to the grace of the Lord. He traveled through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So instead of zero trips, the conflict actually led to two trips. That's a work of God. And I wonder today, what could God be doing in your not so good situation? Maybe something's going on in your life and you say, I can't see any way God can work in this. And God can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you think or imagine. It may be today that you mess things up yourself and how can God do it? God is sovereign. He can. It may be that someone has messed up things in your life and you're in conflict. How can I overcome it? Look to God. He's sovereign. Well, I want you to see a final point. A final point today, and it's this. Reconciliation between brothers is desirable and attainable. Can God work in spite of and through conflict? Yes, he can. But it is not God's chosen modus operandi. He moves more freely through less resistance. You know, this text, and I was sharing in Sunday school today, is part of the Bible that's called a narrative or a descriptive text. The beautiful thing about the narratives, they give us enough information that we need to understand. And when they share the inf information in the narratives, as I shared earlier, they don't edit it. You know, if they had just said everything was hunky-dory, we would have missed everything. We wouldn't have been able to see what God could do, but it shares exactly as it is. So there are narratives in the Bible. There are narratives that, aren't, that don't reflect on people who are great. For instance, King David um, had Uriah's life taken after he had taken Uriah's wife. And, and again, David's a hero, but he was a fallible person. But... This is a descriptive, but not a prescriptive part. A descriptive describes what happens. That's what we see in Acts 15. A prescriptive gives a command. It gives a statute. It gives a principle that you must follow. The, the Ten Commandments are prescriptive. Thou shalt not kill. And so what we need to be very careful is when we take a descriptive part of the Bible and try to make it prescriptive. In other words, it would be like this. It would be wrong for us to say, well, you know what? Paul and Barnabas couldn't get along, and I'm not getting along with my brother or sister in the church, and you know, it must be okay. It was okay for them. It's okay for me. No, it's not okay. Just because the Bible describes something doesn't mean that it prescribes something. Reconciliation is the way of the Christian. Reconciliation is the core of our faith. If you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only way you're in right standing with God is through reconciliation of God sending his son to die for you. While we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. God is a reconciling God. Let's look at John, Mark, and Paul again in this situation. We saw about two or three months ago in Acts chapter 13, things were going well early in the first trip. And then there's a, just a brief part of a verse that said, John Mark returned to Jerusalem to his home. We don't know why he returned. He was young. Maybe he was homesick. We don't know that it may have been that he had a difference of opinion as to the direction that the leaders of the trip it may have even been that John Mark just 
picked up and left without two weeks notice, just abandoned them. Maybe he had a responsibility and he abandoned that. We don't know. All we know is that it really, really bothered Paul. And so we see here in, in Acts chapter 15, that's a little over a year later, and Barnabas is ready to forgive and to move on. It was still a problem with Paul. Can we trust him? He abandoned us once, he would do it again. And if the story between Paul and John Mark ended here, we would wonder, and we would probably be a little down, but the beautiful part is we see in 2 Timothy chapter 4, if you'll look with me in 2 Timothy chapter 4. It is about 15 years after this discourse in Acts chapter 15. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, we read in verse 11, Paul says, only Luke is with me. Bring Mark, that is John Mark, with you, for he is useful to me in the ministry. Some 15 years later, Paul is nearing his time of death, 2 Timothy 4 being his last epistle, and he's saying, bring John Mark to me. He's useful. This, man, this young man who 15 years earlier, Paul had no confidence, now said, I need him because he's useful. That says a lot about John Mark. Obviously, you shouldn't give up on John Mark. He, he came around. It says a lot about Paul, even though he may not have in so many words here said, I'm sorry, I was wrong. But he understood that he could adjust and count on John Mark. And that's the beautiful part of reconciliation. It is a beautiful thing. It's a Christian word. It's a healing word. If you hear somebody say, that person is dead to me, you can be sure that's not a Christian statement at all. That is an anti-Christian statement. We don't know all that transpired. But we do know this. By the end, these two individuals were reconciled. Before we move on, there are just a couple of things that I want to note as we prepare next week to move into the second journey. But today, as we look back, and the first is this, just because someone has failed at one point does not mean that that person is never again useful in kingdom work. Just because someone has failed, sometimes people need second chances, third chances, fourth chances. I'm thankful that the Bible tells us that Paul realized John Mark's usefulness. But I want you to see a second thing that is very beautiful and important. Forgiveness leading to reconciliation is a beautiful thing because it is consistent with the Christian faith. Reconciliation. Some today here, maybe someone has done something or said something to hurt you. The first thing to do is make peace with it yourself. Realize the battle is not yours. It tells us in the book of Romans, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You know what? God can take care of those who've hurt us much more knowingly than we can. So you say, do I go talk to that person right now? Well, the first step is make peace with it yourself to say, God, I'm leaving that situation to you. God, you work in healing. God, if you lead and provide the opportunity for me to talk to that person, make it clear. But God, I'm willing to do whatever you would lead me to do. Reconciliation is a beautiful thing. Just think of these couple of sayings. If we think we hold a grudge, in reality, the grudge holds us. Somebody said this, Louis B. Smeads, he said, you forgive and you set a prisoner free and you realize that prisoner is you. The late Timothy Keller, Mildred used to go to his church uh, when he was pastoring in Hopewell and he pastored in New York City for a number of years. He recently passed away of cancer and on a lack of forgiveness, he said this, if we don't forgive, the evil done to you has come into you and is shaping you. I don't know about you, but I don't want that to happen because Paul, <clears throat> 
who eventually was restored to John Mark, wrote this in Colossians 3, 13, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are to forgive. Hey, this gospel train is moving forward. We're going to see next week how the gospel is continuing to move. I believe the gospel is moving even today. I'm excited about the opportunities in 2024. We're seeing great things that are happening in missions that we're sponsoring around the world, opportunities that will lie ahead, great things that are happening into our uh, in our own community. And the beautiful thing is when God's in it, when his sovereign hand is in it, it will not stop. But I have a twofold application today as we close. What is your mission this year? What is God calling you to do? He's given you a mission. Are you taking the time and reflecting upon it quietly in your home God, who would you have me to minister to? How would you have me to minister? Is it a specific structural thing that I'm to do? Is it something in the community? What are you doing to protect and pursue the mission that God is giving you? And then the second thing, is there a root of unforgiveness in your heart? Do we see here where God worked in spite of it? Yes, but we can't even imagine how much more he could have done if there had been a concerted effort rather than a divided effort. Pride is one of the ugliest things. And when we set ourselves in the sand and say, I will not give in, I am right, and that person is totally wrong, then we put ourselves in a position where we can't be a ministering agent. Remember Jesus, when he was hanging on the cross, said, Father, forgive them. The people who were killing him, forgive them, for they know not what they do. God, give us a heart of forgiveness. God, give it first between you and me, Lord, work in my life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the narratives in the Bible. Lord, it may have taken Paul up to 15 years to work things out. We don't know. We thank you that you included in 2 Timothy this reconciliation between these two individuals. And so, Father, as we go into this new year, may we be reminded that not one of us is more important than the mission that you have given this church. And, Father, as we remember that, may we also be conscious of the fact, Lord, that we need the healing that reconciliation brings. God, you're the great reconciler. Help us to be agents of reconciliation in our world. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.